What happened in The Witcher Season 3, Part 1? What was with all that wizardy politics? Have they come back to following the books more closely? And what's coming up in the last three episodes? Let's take a look. Hi everyone, this is Robert. Welcome to In Deep Geek. On this channel we cover The Witcher, A Song of Ice and Fire, The Lord of the Rings and more in depth. If you like the sound of that, there's a subscribe button in the bottom right of your screen. The Witcher Season 3 is being released in two parts. This video covers the first part of the season, and I'll follow it up with another video for the finale. There are obviously spoilers here if you haven't seen all of the first five episodes, and also for the books, though the TV show is not telling the story exactly as it is in the books. The overarching plot for these episodes is the hunt for Ciri, lots of people are chasing after her in this season, and our Witcher family's attempts to protect her. The world of the continent is complex, and behind the scenes there are plots and alliances and betrayals going on all over the place. Geralt in particular is trying to stay neutral and just focus on protecting Ciri, but that gets harder the deeper into the plot we go. To unpick all of these plots, we should probably start off with Ciri. You'll remember that by the end of Season 2 we had discovered that Ciri is very important, and for lots of different reasons. She's important politically, as the heir of Sintra, the strategically significant city-state at the heart of the continent, and she's also important magically, the result of a centuries-long genetic experiment started by the elves to effectively create a magical superweapon, a source, and she's also hugely important prophetically. So lots of people are trying to track her down. The elves, because she is their child of the Elder Blood, or perhaps her child will be after her, Emir Var Emris, the ruler of Nilfgaard, both because of her political importance and because she is his daughter. The various northern kingdoms, in particular Redania, the strongest because of her political importance. The Wild Hunt, including Voleth Mir, the main antagonist of last season, because, well, I'm sure that will all be revealed in later seasons, but if you've played the games or read the books, you'll know. Plus there's Ryance, who we'll get to in a moment, and the Wizards, who are not exactly united. As I said, it's a complex picture but we can unpick it one thread at a time. And the key thing is that right now, there's pretty much nowhere where Ciri can be 100% safe. We pick up at the start of the season with our little Witcher family as they are trying to hide from all these people hunting her. They can never fully rest, but when they can for a bit, Yennefer tries to teach Ciri how to access her magic and how to control it. It's clear that Ciri is incredibly powerful, but doesn't yet have much control over her powers. She makes some slow progress, but slow progress is still progress, and it's clear that she will be a force to be reckoned with in time. First the Witcher training, now the magical training. Not that all is sunshine and light in the Witcher family. Last season, Yennefer decided to sacrifice Ciri to Voleth Mir in an effort to get her magic back. Geralt hasn't forgiven her yet, so it's a bit frosty between them to start with, but by episode 5 things are back on track. Destiny is keeping them together. The person closest on their trail to start with is Ryance, the fire mage who was also chasing Ciri last season. He's pretty dangerous, first hiring some mercenaries to search for Ciri, which Geralt easily dispatches, then gets a Jackapace monster, an armadillo-like monster with a great sense of smell to track them. The Jackapace, an original monster for this season, tracks Ciri to a Beltane party. It is relatively easily dispatched, but Ryance now knows where they are, so they have to get on the move again. But instead of just staying on the run, they hatch a cunning plan to draw him out. This cunning plan is basically to put Ciri in a caravan as bait, with some less than discreet friends, Yarpen and Yaskia, who will tell people about it, and then when Ryance does turn up, Yennefer and Geralt can jump out and get him. The plan nearly works. Geralt manages to break Ryance's arms, though he does escape. This is obviously a problem because he will surely be back, and he is also surely working for someone. A more powerful mage, perhaps. The question is who? So the teams split up again. Yennefer thinks Aratuza, where she trained all those years ago, is probably the safest place for Ciri, so they head off there while Geralt tries to figure out who Ryance's boss is. 
His first call is to Codringer and Fenn, the rather sedentary private investigators, who send him on to a place called Vilpan, where things get a bit weird. First, there's a monster seemingly made from random body parts and some heads embedded in a wall that seem connected to it. Geralt kills that. And in a mucus sack, a young woman who looks a lot like Ciri and believes that she is Ciri and begs Geralt to kill him, whoever he may be, presumably the mysterious sorcerer. After a bit more digging and a visit to one of his mother's friends, he gets a bit more backstory. The woman's real name is Terin. She'd been captured by a mysterious man and a woman with a funny voice. Why? We don't find out all the details in this system, but book readers will know that a false Siri plays an important part later on. Actually, it's probably easiest at this point to simply say that, although it isn't revealed until the very end of episode 5, the mysterious sorcerer behind all this is Vilgefortz. The woman with the funny voice is Lydia, who was secretly in love with him. Vilgefortz hired Ryance, and the false Siri and the weird body part monster were his doing. They are secretly partnering with Nilfgaard and Emir Var Emilis to try to find Ciri, but Vilgefortz has his own agenda. In the books, Vilgefortz is trying to get Ciri for her magical power, and doesn't really want to hand her over to Emir, so it makes sense if on the TV show he is secretly trying to create a false Ciri, who believes that she is Ciri. He could present that one to Emir and keep the real Ciri for himself, but we'll see if they go down that route on the show. As an aside, Vilgefortz being the big baddie is set up as the big plot twist in this half-season, but there have been hints about this before. For example, you may remember a rather random scene in the aftermath of the Battle of Sodden Hill, where Vilgefortz takes the opportunity to brutally murder one of the Brotherhood of Sorcerers. No explanation was given at the time, but looking back, he seems to have been trying to use the situation to weaken opposition within his own group. Anyway, Geralt is blissfully unaware of all of this, but can tell that the person behind it all must be a powerful sorcerer, so he heads off to Aratuza as well to get to the bottom of it all, and arrives nearby just in time to rescue Ciri, who is being chased by the Wild Hunt. Why was she there alone, and why was she being chased? Well, let's turn back to what Yennefer and Ciri were up to while Geralt was off investigating. There's quite a bit of teaching going on, and Yennefer tries to persuade Ciri that Aratuza really is the best place for her, but eventually they make it to just outside. They can't portal in because of the magical defences. Yennefer has some business to attend to, so Ciri goes off and gets into mischief before being rescued or found again by Yennefer and some of her Aratuza buddies, Tessaya, Rita and Sabrina. Those four then engage in a heady evening of political plotting and getting very drunk always a good mix. Ciri isn't impressed. This is a long way from Geralt's neutrality stance. She gives him a call on a handy magic coin she has and heads away in frustration. That's where the Wild Hunt find her and chase her. How? Well, it seems that at the end of last season, when she moved between worlds and Volithmir escaped and went into the Wild Hunt and she then jumped back with Geralt and Yennefer, she kind of left the door open a crack, so they can now come through and hunt her in her own world. Not good. Thankfully, on this occasion, Geralt arrives just in time to save her. Yennefer, meanwhile, has got heavily into the politics of all this. She comes up with a plan with Tessaya to set up a conclave of mages so that they can all come together and agree how to help the rulers of the Northern Kingdoms ensure peace and come together to face the threat of another potential Nilfgaardian invasion. The mages there agree, and Yennefer heads off via portal to Redania to invite Philippa Eilhart, a powerful mage in her own right and deeply involved in what's going on in Redania. We'll cover that extra layer of intrigue and politics in a moment. It takes a bit of persuasion, but eventually King Visimir agrees to send Philippa, as well as Dijkstra, the spymaster, and Radovid, the king's brother. Just as importantly, though, when portaling back, Yennefer nearly dies. She appears right on a cliff edge and gets attacked by an illusory Geralt, which seems a bit random, until you remember that the person who supplied the portal was Vilgefortz, the still-secret big baddie. He was trying to kill off Yennefer. She survives, though, and meets back up with the real Geralt. 
They compare notes and add in a couple of extra bits of information they've just found out. Triss explains that a lot of half-elven novices have been mysteriously disappearing from Aratusa. Perhaps there's a link there to the young women Geralt found having been experimented on earlier in the season, including the false Siri. And Istrid, Yen's old lover, has found that the Book of Monoliths, a book of magic that can help in portaling between worlds, has been taken by someone here at Aratusa. So those are the clues that Geralt and Yennefer are going into the Conclave and the Ball beforehand focusing on. However, let's leave them there for a moment and pick up the other strands of this web of intrigue before we venture into the Ball itself. At the end of last season, we learned that Emir Var Emris, the Emperor of Nilfgaard, is none other than Ciri's father. His repeated invasions of the North are about bringing peace through war to a continent united under him, yes, but they're also about finding Ciri. And although he spends most of this half of the season staying where he is, he is pulling a lot of strings behind the scenes. First, as we've already noted, he has come to an arrangement with Vilgeforts, and therefore Ryants, for them to find Ciri and also, towards the end of the season, comes to an agreement with Francesca and the Elves. To the Elves, Ciri is the prophesied one who will vanquish their enemies and lead them to peace, and they nearly manage to capture her in the first episode. That failure, and other failures, leads to a bit of a split in Elven leadership. Galatin disagrees with Francesca's approach and heads off, meeting Cahir. Remember him? He's the Black Knight Nilfgaardian who tried to capture Ciri for Emir all the way back in Season 1. His failure left him out of favour, but now he sees a way to win his way back by bringing Galatin to Emir and suggesting an alliance of sorts. Emir decides instead to test Cahir's loyalty by ordering him to kill Galatin, which he does. Now back in Emir's good graces, Cahir is then sent off to treat with Francesca. They agree, and she is set her first task. So Emir is secretly dealing with Vilgeforts and Francesca and the elves, and also King Visimir of Redania. Redania is the most powerful of the Northern Kingdoms, so this is huge news. The deal is that Nilfgaard can invade the North again, but would spare Redania and allow them to rule half of one of their rivals. This deal comes as quite a surprise, however, to Dijkstra, Redania's spymaster, and Philippa the court mage and Dijkstra's lover. Visimir went ahead with the deal on his own with his wife without telling them at all. It's clear that Visimir no longer trusts Dijkstra like he used to after Dijkstra's failure to find Ciri last season, and underlines this by taking Dijkstra off the case entirely and appointing his younger brother Radovid to find Ciri. Enter Yaskia, who has been employed by Dijkstra in the past, remember his sint as the Sandpiper, rescuing elves last season. He is known to be close to Geralt and therefore Ciri. So Team Redanian Intelligence try to get him to give them Ciri. Philippa playing bad cop, Radovid good cop, both trying to impress on him the point that Redania is surely the safest place for Ciri to hide. Yaskia, meanwhile, is trying to get them to give up Ryants, who they know. The wild card here is Radovid, who is a very different character to the one we see in the video games set years later. There he is Radovid the Stern, son of Vizimir, but here he is much more relaxed and charming, and the king's younger brother, not son. He also starts up something of a romance with Yaskia. We'll have to see where that goes in the future. But despite all the appearances, it seems that he's actually a lot cleverer and subtle than first meets the eye. Dijkstra, meanwhile, has a lot more direct way of undoing King Visimir's deal with Nilfgaard and regaining his trust. He kills Visimir's wife, frames Nilfgaard, and has her head presented to Visimir in a box. Dijkstra is clearly out for himself, but also very much anti-Nilfgaard. So by the time we reach the ball in episode 5, we have quite a complex situation on the continent, everyone with their own agendas. But very broadly, there are two sets of shared interests. A set of people who are working with or allied to Nilfgaard and Emir Var Emris, and a group of people who are opposed to that. The first group contains people like Vilgeforts, Lydia, Ryans, King Visimir of Redania, Francesca and the Elves, and on the other side, Dijkstra and Philippa, Tessire and Yennefer, Radovid and so on. 
And in the middle, there are a bunch of people who aren't really on either side. Triss, who is currently caring most about those missing half-elves, Stregobor, who is a rather racist loose cannon, and Geralt, who always tries to be neutral. At the ball, everyone is on their best behaviour, but you can see the pieces moving on the board. Geralt is clearly very important in most people's eyes, both as Ciri's protector and as a powerful figure in his own right. Dijkstra and Vilgefortz both try to get him on their respective sides in the margins of the ball, and Geralt says no. But through this we are being distracted by Geralt and Yennefer following their clues to try to find out who hired Ryans. They go into this suspecting Stregobor, because, well, he's Stregobor, and soon find the Book of Monoliths in his room. When challenged, he also admits to killing those half-elf novices. He is arrested, and it seems like game set and match. Geralt tells Yennefer he loves her, they dance and spend a night of passion and talking through the events of the evening when, hang on a minute, they realise that the clifftop Yennefer got portaled to that nearly killed her is exactly the same as in Vilgefortz's favourite painting. And Lydia has some jewellery made from gems from that creepy cave where false Siri was, and Tissaia, Vilgefortz's lover, has the same, so the connecting factor here is Vilgefortz. Geralt rushes from his room to be faced with Dijkstra's dagger and sounds of fighting. Geralt may care most about protecting Ciri and finding out who hired Ryance, but lots of other people there are focused on the peace conference the next day. To be fair to them, it's quite an important geopolitical moment, and at least someone doesn't want the peace conference to go ahead. So, what's next? Well, there are of course some important characters not at the ball. Francesca and the elves to start with, but they have been given a task by Emhir, who definitely doesn't want the Northern Lords coming together in opposition to him, so we'll want to disrupt that. Expect to see them soon. Ciri is in a house not too far away, theoretically being protected by Yaskia, though she would probably be better at protecting him, and he seems more than a little distracted by the sudden arrival of Radovid. How will Ciri react once she discovers what's going on over in Aratusa? And is Radovid just using Yaskia to get at her? What does he have planned? And at Aratusa itself, who will emerge victorious? And can any trust or hope or peace emerge from the collision of so many different backstabbing agendas? In the books, this moment is one of the key turning points in the whole story, and on the show, they've paused halfway through. I'm really looking forward to seeing how they play it out. Episodes 6, 7 and 8 will tell all. If you'd like more explainers or deep dives into The Witcher and other great fantasy worlds like The Lord of the Rings or Game of Thrones, please click on the link on the left of your screen. Or to support this channel, there's a link to my Patreon on the right of your screen. Thanks for watching. That's all for this time. I'll see you again soon.